not in the Bible? That's the last time you'll get to hear that. Jenny told me when Hunter first heard himself in that video, he said, that's not me. <laughs> I, I want to thank you for being here today. And the seasons are, are changing, and I have been sensing lately the realness of God. There's something about the, the changing of the seasons that just reminds me that this creation has design. We're not here by an accident. It has order. And all of that makes me feel that God is real. Another thing that makes me feel that God is real, the Cubs are in the playoffs. And the Cardinals are not. So for him who has eyes to see, see the truth about God. Now, I'm, I'm a lover of the game of baseball. And... One of the best baseball players was Yogi Berra, who, who died a little over a year ago. And he became l known later in his life for, for his coaching and some of the, the comical ways that he would say things. And, and if you're younger, though, you, you really might not realize that he really, truly was a great baseball player. You, you can go and check his stats for yourself. And he is a deserved Hall of Famer. But later in life, he became best known for the way that he would try to express himself. And they became known as yogiisms. Let me share a few with you. Regarding restaurants, he once said, No one goes there anymore. It's too crowded. <laughs> Regarding the economy, he said, A nickel ain't worth a dime anymore. Regarding directions, he said, when you come to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> Regarding fan mail, he said, never answer an anonymous letter. Regarding the game of baseball, he said, baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. <laughs> My favorite, always go to other people's funerals. Otherwise, they won't go to yours. But maybe one of the best things that he ever said was, I really didn't say everything I said. And what he was alluding to was that through the years, people would ascribe to him sayings that sounded like something he would say, but he didn't actually say it. And that is what people do with the Bible. In a culture where there's a lot of Christian expressions we hear phrases that we think they they just sound like they come from the Bible like follow your heart or everything happens for a reason or God will never give you more than you can handle and if you haven't listened to any of those messages you need to you need to get on our website and you need to go listen to those sermons but I want to end today our series with the most common misperception people have about what the Bible says. And it's very critical that we explore it because it actually has to do with salvation, which may, makes it the most dangerous misconception that people have. And, and it's this. Most people think that the Bible teaches that being good is good enough. Apparently, the most popular defense before God in the minds of people is this, that you need to give God clear evidence that you have basically been a good person. There are many examples of this kind of thinking. Recently, Warren Buffett, who is, I'm told, the world's second most richest man alive, announced that he was going to to give away most of his wealth to charity, which is very commendable. But I cannot commend what he said about it. He said, there is more than one way to go to heaven, but this is a great way. In other words, just find a way to be good, to do something that's, that's good, because being good is good enough. That's what most people say. But the Bible 
never says it. In fact, the Bible says, write this down, that be good is bad theology. Now it's feel good theology, but the Bible says it is no good theology. It does feel good though, because it allows every person to set the bar of righteousness wherever they want to set it. And so it allows the person to be the spiritual person they want to be without really being judgmental. You hear this all the time. Well, I'm spiritual. I'm just not religious. What exactly does that mean? What it means is I will live by a standard of morality that I have decided on. I will hold to certain convictions that I believe are important. In other words, I'll go down the cafeteria line and I will put on my tray those moralities and those convictions that I want. I will create a designer faith and be spiritual because after all, being good is good enough. And under this understanding, most religions have merit. Because they can help you do that. And that is what people think. So in the religious world where I tend to live, there is a phrase that showed up about 11 years ago called moralistic therapeutic deism. It's from a book. It was published way back in 2005 by two sociologists that interviewed and surveyed thousands of teenagers in America about their religious beliefs. Now, most of these teenagers would have claimed Christianity as their belief system, but it included several other faith traditions and a lot of teens who didn't have a particular faith tradition at all. But what the researchers found was that it did not matter. Almost all of the teenagers believed basically the same thing. You should try to be a good person. God is there if you have a problem. Otherwise, he's not very involved. Moralistic, therapeutic deism. The author said it has five basic tenets. First, God exists and he made the world. There is a God out there. That is why we are here. Secondly, God wants people to be good. Now that is ambiguous because you get to define what good is, but that is what God wants. Third, the main goal of life is to be happy. So ultimately, it's all about me. Fourth, God isn't too involved unless you need a problem to be solved. God will basically mind his own business except to help you out periodically in your life. And fifth, good people go to heaven. That is what happens when young people come to church and we tell them what they ought to do, but they don't learn what Jesus has done. You see, all religions basically have this in common. They are teaching you how to build stairs to reach God. Now, the stairs will differ a little bit, but basically they, they have the same rules. Read a lot of this. Pray a lot of that. Do a bunch of these things. And you will build stairs that you need that will be good enough for you to get to God. And nobody believes that you can attain moral perfection. But that's okay because everybody knows God graves on the curve. So just be good. Because being good is good enough. But the Bible never says that. In fact, when you read the Gospels, you find that Jesus had a total disregard for be good theology. One of the clearest examples is a story that he told about two guys that go to the temple to pray. One guy, Jesus called a, a Pharisee, don't get too hung up on that. That just means that he was a very religious man. And he prayed to God reminding God that he was really a very good guy. He said, I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything that I have. And he was telling the truth. He really was a good guy. Now, the second guy, Jesus called a tax collector. That doesn't really communicate to us. So let me change that a little bit. 
He was an ISIS fundraiser. Because that is what Jesus' audience heard when he said tax collector. Tax collectors were the people in Jesus' day that, that took your money to fund a brutal, sadistic, occupying army. And all this guy could pray was, God, I got nothing. I need mercy. And then Jesus said something that made every jaw drop. He said, the ISIS fundraiser went home justified before God, but good guy didn't. How is that possible? How can somebody who is so bad be closer to God than somebody who is so good? Well, Jesus would explain it this way over and over. Write it down. My goodness is my greatest barrier to God. You see, the appeal of religion is that it offers a way to measure goodness based on external metrics. And it really does feel good. Because I can find a way to measure myself to you that, that makes me seem good according to the metrics that I use. But the Bible says that you and I are not the standard for measuring goodness. The standard for goodness is God. And to illustrate that, just a few verses after Jesus told that revolutionary story, a real-life illustration shows up in the 18th chapter of Luke. And before I begin with that story, he talks about this ruler, a certain ruler. That word ruler here means that this person was a leader in the synagogue. In other words, he is a very respected religious individual, a moral individual. Not only that, we see in another account that the gospel records in another gospel that this encounter was a young man who was very wealthy. And understand in their day, their belief was that you, if you were rich, that's because God had blessed you. His favor was upon you. Prosperity theology is not new. They believed if you were rich, it was a sign that you were actually a very good person. This ruler is the guy every pastor wants to have at their church. I mean, he's the guy that you want to have your daughter marry. So let's look at the story. Luke 18, verse 18. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. This ruler thinks like most people. When, when you stand before God, there's, there's going to be a, a scale and all of the bad things that you have done are on one side and all the good things that you have done are going to be on the other side. And, and you want all of the good things to outweigh all of the bad things. I want a, a credit sheet that shows a, a heavy balance of, of good. Here is the problem. This common view is absolutely blown out of the water over and over and over in the Bible for this simple reason. Romans chapter 3, verse 10, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. A preacher that I love listening to was telling a story that he took his family to New Mexico on a ski trip. And he said they were, they were driving down a two-lane road, and just before they got to the mountains where they were headed, he looked off to his side, and there was this pasture of, of mainly some grass and mud uh, and, and a flock of sheep. And he said that compared to their dirty background, the, the sheep's wool looked pristine and amazing, just dotting this pasture. They went and skied for a few days, and while they were there, a, a very big snowstorm came and just, just dumped a ton of snow in that whole area. They said when they were driving back home several days later, down that same road, he looked off to his side again at that same pasture, and this time it's blanketed with a fresh carpet of brilliant white snow. And now those same sheep against that backdrop look filthy, they're dingy, they're dirty. Same sheep, different standard. And that is what Jesus is trying to get this ruler 
to see. Stop comparing your goodness to other people and start comparing it to God. God cares about the poor because God is good. You've got a lot of money, go sell your stuff to the poor. Be like God. And what the young man realizes, he doesn't want to be that good. Nobody can be as good as God. And what Jesus exposed is something that a lot of people just don't really get. It is that there is not really that much difference between very irreligious people and very religious people. They have the same problem. They don't think they need God. The very irreligious person says, I'm going to live my life by my own rules. I'm going to do what I want. I don't need God. I'm going to do it my way. The very religious person says, I pray this. I, I, I read that. I do this. I don't need God. And what is amazing is that the bad person recognizes his problem before the good person does. That's why Jesus said one time in Matthew chapter 21, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. Because your goodness is your greatest barrier to God. So the rich young ruler starts to walk away. And look at what Jesus says in Luke 18, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We like to focus on the wealthy part of that. But I'm telling you, it's not just rich that is the problem. It is goodness. And you've heard that all your life, and it doesn't have much power to it, so I want to reframe it for you. I, I, I'm, I'm getting older, and there are a few things on my bucket list that I would like to do at least once before I die. For example, I would like to dunk a basketball unaided by myself <laughs> at least once before I die. I would also like to be the President of the United States. I think it would be great if I could have my own plane. What are the odds? What are the odds that I would ever be elected president? Maybe one in 350 million. But they are better than the odds that I would ever dunk a basketball unaided. Unless they lower the rim to four feet. But listen. I will be president who dunks basketballs before I will be good enough to meet God on my own good terms. And if you feel a little uneasy, you're supposed to feel that. That is exactly what the disciples felt because their entire life they were taught that, that being good is good enough. And, and now the best guy that they have ever seen, this rich young ruler, He's not good enough for the kingdom. So they, they ask the only question that they could ask. They ask in verse 26, who then can be saved? If this guy can't be good enough, what hope is there for anyone? And you need to hear Jesus answer. Verse 27, Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. And here is the whole sermon in one sentence. Salvation is not a merit. Salvation is a miracle. If we could be saved by being good, why did Jesus need to come? We already had the law of Moses. That teaches you how to build stairs. The answer, the reason Jesus came, is what separates the good news of Christianity from the good advice of every other world religion. So the Sunday school teacher has a kindergarten class and she says, so if I sold my house and my car and I gave all of my money to the poor, could I go to heaven? And they said, no! She asked, well, if I came and I cleaned the church building and I mowed the church's yard, could I go to heaven then? All the kids said, no. She asked, well, what if I was nice to all of the animals and, 
And I went to the hospital and I gave all the sick children candy. Could I go to heaven then? And they all said no. And she said, so, so what do I got to do to go to heaven? And one little boy said, you got to be dead. <laughs> Jesus did not come to save good people. He came to save dead people. A dead person cannot do anything to become better. Write this down. The good news is the gift of God's goodness through Christ. Jesus did not come to help people get better. He came to help people get born again. Because we weren't good. We were dead in our sins. That is exactly what Paul says in the second chapter of Ephesians, verses 8 and 9. Then he says this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You cannot take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things that you have done. None of us can boast about it. Your metrics don't make you measure higher than anybody else. Look what Paul writes in, in Titus chapter 3 verse 5. He saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy. God sees goodness in us when He sees in us His good Son. One of the most amazing verses in the entire Bible to me is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen to me. The good news is not better stairs. The good news is that Jesus is our lift. We're not saved by being good. We are saved by believing in Jesus and in God's promise to transfer the goodness of Jesus onto us. Salvation is not a merit. It is a miracle because the sinless Savior died for my sinful soul is counted free for God. The just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Someone I know back years back was finishing his time in seminary trying to try to get a very prestigious theological degree a master's of divinity and in his oral exam he sat in a room with a bunch of professors and one of them gave him a Hebrew text and said I want you to translate that for me one of them gave him a Greek text and said I need you to translate that for me they asked him several very complicated, hard, difficult, theological questions. And then toward the end, one of the professors who had not yet spoken asked, what is necessary for salvation? This preacher friend of mine said, now, what does he want? And he's thinking of all the different verses and all of the different theories of atonement. So he kind of starts going down that road. And the professor was getting more and more visibly perturbed. And finally, he stopped him and he said, you've been at this school for several years and you don't know what's necessary for salvation. God, God is necessary for salvation. Because listen, what is impossible for you is possible for God. No one is going to get to heaven and say, I helped. That is what our two sacraments remind us. God has given the church two things to do. To, to baptize and to share the Lord's Supper. You ever notice how passive we are in both of those things? Someone baptizes you. You don't baptize yourself. Someone serves you communion to remind you that salvation is a gift to you. Because being good is not good enough. Jesus is good enough. And that is very good enough. 
And that is very good news to everyone who knows they will never be good enough. Now, is what I'm saying too good to be true? I would answer the gospel is too good to not be true. People who say that all religions are basically the same have not studied all religions. Christianity is so very different. Every other religion says, here is a way to build a, a set of stairs and be good. Christianity says, you are so bad. God had to become one of you and die in your place. Nobody would make something like that up. There's only one religion that says it is finished and it will let you get off the try to be better treadmill. So dozens of times I have literally had conversations with someone that I am imploring to accept Jesus as their Lord and they'll say something like, you, you don't know my past. You don't know what I've done. I'm not good enough to be a Christian. And my answer is always the same. I am not a Christian because I am so good. I'm a Christian because I am too bad to be anything else. I'll never build a set of stairs to reach a holy God. I need a lift. I'm telling you this morning that somebody is, is, is listening and you are hearing what I'm saying, but you're wrestling and you need to understand eternity is literally in the balance. The worst for human badness is goodness substituted for the blood of Jesus. Not a single person listening to me right now is so good that you do not need to be born again. And not a single person listening to me is so bad that you cannot be born again. And what you have to decide, because we are all going to meet God, is are you going to face Him trusting in your own goodness? or his.